Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Hello and welcome to the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 479 for the 24th of December 2017. Where is uh, where's that man in the sleigh? He should be up in the sky somewhere over California. That's where I am at the moment, visiting family and friends for this time of the year. Ho, ho, ho. Coming up on this week's show, another shortened show because it's this time of the year and lots of things are happening. And 12 hours ago, I was flying over the Pacific and more excuses. Anyway, coming up on this week's show, we're going to look at the recent UFO uh, disclosure, which seems to have vanished from the news, to be quite frank, where there's footage of apparent UFO and people are saying the Pentagon spent lots of money, wasted lots of money on UFO research. We'll have a brief look into this story, uh, what they call a flash in the pan, flash in the sky. I don't think much will come of this, but it's worth a mention because it's, well, it's sceptical. Following that, it's Maynard's Spooky Action. More interviews from the recent Australian Skeptics National Convention. Maynard talks to Michelle Vernon from the Newcastle University Atheist and Skeptic Society. Newcastle is uh, where part of my family come from, in fact. Uh, My dad's side of the family are uh, Newcastle people. Newcastle, for those international folks, is just north of Sydney. It's the... um, it's the uh, the city just to the north of Sydney. It was famous for many years for a coal mining area, really sort of industrial. But what a beautiful place it is. Wonderful picturesque beaches and uh, a really nice uh, restaurant scene. In fact, that's where Maynard comes from too. Also on Maynard's spooky action is an interview, a lengthy interview with Adam Spencer from... Well, many people in Australia know him from the ABC, the Australian uh, broadcaster. He's a mathematician, radio presenter and entertainer and a skeptic, of course. I think you'll find this interesting, this uh, interview with Adam Spencer. Then to round off the show, we catch up with a few friends. Uh, we have uh, an update from Susan Gerbeck from Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia, Celestia Ward from Squaring the Strange podcast, and Evan Bernstein from The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe give us each a brief overview of the year that's been uh, for their respective endeavours. Now, before we start, a few comments from me about jet lag. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, you know, it's not so bad, I suppose. Coming Coming from Sydney to the United States is a bit tricky. It's a bit tricky. As I speak to you now, it's... Um, well, local time is... Uh, presses the button here. 6.30 in the evening. On December the 23rd, in fact. But back home in Australia, it's well mid-morning or morning or midday or something like that on the 24th of December. So you can imagine what that does to your body clock when you fly across. Those people who have flown from Sydney to uh, the United States know what I mean. And when it's time to go back from the United States to Sydney, your body clock's all out of whack again. And you tend to wake up at three or four o'clock in the morning absolutely wide awake, which is a good time to get some work done. But come three or four, five, six in the afternoon, you can barely keep your eyes open. As my friend uh, Dr. Stephen Novella from The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe said to me once, we simply weren't evolved to cope with jet lag. But I'm happy to be here. I'll be catching up with uh, Eugenie Scott in a few days, of course. Uh, What a wonderful person Eugenie is. One of my favorite scientists in all the world. And uh, she never ceases to amaze me with her uh, insights and her, her, her charm. It's so good to catch up with people like uh, like her. I don't know if I'll be seeing too many other people while I'm here. It's a bit of a low-key event. But never fear, we'll keep bringing you episodes of The Skeptic Zone. But now it's time for me to run upstairs. Upstairs. Dive into the fridge. The in-laws' fridge. And have one of those little ice cream squares. What do they call them? Eskimo ice creams or something like that? It's, it's like a... Lovely creamy ice cream with a solid chocolate outer coating. Yeah, and it's winter here too. I don't care. That sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> well, I do that. I hope you enjoy 
The Skeptic Zone. Over the last year, I've been doing uh, more than the uh, normal number of radio segments and spots and interviews, which is a lot of fun, of course. And yes, invariably, well, at least from time to time, whenever I'm asked to uh, come on to a radio uh, program and they're, um, they're introducing me, I often hear this. Or even this. In the last week, we had the uh, reports widely reported. Evidence suggests UFOs may have reached Earth, says former Pentagon official. Now, this is the story. You've probably heard something about it where the U.S. government apparently spent millions of dollars over about a seven-year period to investigate, uh, well... UFOs, or strange, uh, anomalistic items in the sky. One of the reports here from the ABC in Australia says a former US military intelligence official has claimed there is evidence that could suggest aliens have visited Earth. Louis Lizondo, a former Pentagon official who recently led a government program to research potential UFOs, believes there is secrecy surrounding the program and told CNN, quote, there is very compelling evidence that we may not be alone, end quote. Mr. Lizondo led the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program from 2007 to 2012, which investigated UFOs. Part of the program's findings still remain classified. Ooh. Now, the startling bit of footage, the only bit of footage, released uh, in conjunction with this story is of uh, some sort of blacked-out object, possibly because of the heat, because it's an infrared image and it's too hot, uh, being tracked by a military aircraft off the coast of San Diego in 2004. Here's some of the audio. Now, it's, it's an interesting bit of footage. I'll link to it in the show notes. So I was curious to know what other people would think uh, just upon viewing this uh, footage, what would they think of it? And some of the replies came back pointing me to various other blogs which have looked at this. Uh, Dr. Steve Novella basically summed it up, summed up saying it's not very compelling. It's interesting, but it doesn't actually point to anything specifically. Other people are suggesting it's a fake or a joke. We've had some arguments online about the tracking. The item in the video is dead center of the screen and appears to be tracked perfectly, even though the uh, camera or the aircraft seems to be on a tilt. And at some stage, the object does rotate a little bit, still being tracked perfectly. Some people say that's perfectly understandable if an item is being tracked. Uh, some people are saying, no, that's obviously fake. It doesn't work that way. Uh, another point, and I think Steve Novella raised this, is we don't have a good understanding of how far the object is away from the aircraft, uh, which could have a bearing on what it is. We have other things saying it's a smudge on the window. I don't buy that one, but it's interesting anyway. More comments. Unidentified. It's perfectly okay to say we don't know, which is true. Another observation. Somebody saying, I'm thinking of an internal reflection via the sun on the inner lens. Possibly. Another comment. In the uncut version, the pilot says it's a drone. I haven't seen the uncut version, so I'd be interested to see that. Ah, uh, here's another one saying that uh, more investigation and analysis is needed, which I would agree with. I think even by the time this podcast comes out, because it's this uh, 
I'm recording this a few days before, we might know more. Or in the weeks to come, it might be um, analyzed to an extent that a very good explanation is forthcoming. At this stage, despite the headlines and the the interest in the UFO angle, the alien spaceship angle, we've got no reason to suspect or believe it could possibly be an alien spaceship. There are many, 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 many other things to get through before we come to that uh, conclusion. But in what they call the silly season in Australia, which is winding down the year, usually late uh, December, January, when uh, politics are quiet and uh, these stories seem to get a run, well, at least it's an interesting one, and from a sceptical point of view, it's quite fascinating. Is the truth out there? Quackwatch, your guide to quackery, health fraud and intelligent decisions operated by Stephen Barrett, MD. Quackwatch is now an international network of people who are concerned about health-related frauds, myths, fads, fallacies, and misconduct. Its primary focus is on quackery-related information that is difficult or impossible to get elsewhere. Articles on quackery include... Quackery. How should it be defined? How it sells? 26 ways to spot it. How it harms cancer patients. Seven warning signs for bogus science. Why health professionals become quacks. And many more, including in-depth looks at acupuncture, chiropractic, homeopathy, naturopathy, and much more. Visit www.quackwatch.com. Here's Maynard's spooky action at a distance. Well, look, I'm just waiting to go on here, waiting for the room to fill with hilariously funny skeptics drinking heavily. Who have we got here? I'm Michelle Vernon ah, from look, Newcastle. Now, yeah, on Newcastle. Look, uh, you are the Newcastle skeptic. <laughs> I am. I'm actually the president of the University of Newcastle Atheist and Skeptic Society. Ah, yes. I've been to a few of the meetings with your previous president. How's it going there? And how many members have you got? Brett Edmund, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, at the moment, our Facebook page has about six or 700 people. Um, officially, we only have about 120 uh, financial members, um, but that's actually pretty good. The, the, look, the club look. died down for a couple of years, and we've just been slowly getting it back up and running. So, What sort of events have you been having? Have you sort of been protesting out the front of churches or anything like that? that you know not exactly we've been trying to create a constructive dialogue with some of the religious groups on campus so this is something that was going on before where you all get together and have a bit of a chat yeah Mm. so uh the evangelical groups on campus uh they send a few representatives to our events quite frequently um the Newcastle Christian students in particular. We have a few contacts with them that have been very good to us. Um, they're usually good sports. They come along to our events and debate with us and uh, sometimes they got bombarded with, with criticism because they're in the minority but they're, they're really good sports about it surprisingly. And Did you ever have any Bible readings together? Because that can sometimes be pretty interesting. We've been invited but so far I haven't attended any. Yeah. Oh look, if you get there and they're doing Genesis, how boring. You know? <laughs> That's actually my favourite part of the Bible. Oh, really? I'm, I'm a bit of an Ezekiel fan because it's like one big trip. (laughs) I guess so. Yeah, look, isn't it funny how atheists kind of know the Bible a bit better than most people that are actually Christians and go along? True. Uh, Usually I find that they're very surprised when they discover that we have read the Bible. Mm. Yeah. Would you have a good night tonight? What what are you hoping to get from this evening? Good food. Look, Adam Spencer's here. He's working on the Fibonacci sequence. How's it coming along? Yeah, um, I get an impression someone's already done it. Oh, really? Yeah, his name was Fibonacci. That sucks. Oh, right, OK. I thought it was something that had to be solved about it. No, no. We know, we know the Fibonacci because you were thinking Fermat's last theorem, which uh, a guy called Andrew Wiles um, solved back in the 1990s. There's a book by a guy called Simon Singh called Fermat's Last Theorem, which is the greatest piece of popular mathematics writing ever. Read that, and it's a wonderful story. Now, as a man who has a brain for numbers, does that mean you don't have a brain for other things? Like, uh, because you can write quite well. Is there something, the the numbers bit's taken up the bit of your brain that should be something else? Have you missed out on something by getting the numbers? It's an interesting question. My one skill that I've got that I'm lucky is that I can hop between the numerical and verbal world reasonably well. Uh, 
I've certainly missed the, uh, according to my girlfriend, I've missed the male posture gene. Oh, I well, slouch. Well, standing around. I tend to slump. Oh. I tend to slump. She doesn't like that. She's, well, you're kind of tall, so well, maybe she, that's She's fine. Russian born. And the um, oh, they're harsh. Well, yeah, and and after a while of me saying to her, look, you really, when I'm talking to people at events and all that, you can't just come up and go posture, posture. Turns out the Russian word for posture is vaprimius, and so she'll just walk up and stroke my arm and go, oh, vaprimius, and I go, oh, vaprimius. So it sounds like I'm saying I love you, I love you too, and she's actually saying, stand up straight, you lazy bastard. And how do you get on around the house there? Have you got bits of paper that you're writing numbers on all the time, just doing some squiggles and things like that? It's funny when I was putting this current book together. Oh, which is, please tell us. The number games. Go to adamspencer.com.au, that website again, adamspencer.com.au, uh, for a signed copy. I was putting the book together, and I had a little... I'd found online this little problem, and uh, I was going to pose it as a puzzle in the book, and I wanted to work out, was it too hard or was it reasonable? So I was doing some of the calculations myself. I, I'd just woken up early in the morning, and so Yana woke up about seven, and I'd been there since about quarter past six, just scribbling on these bits of paper, scribbling, scribbling, scribbling. And I didn't even realise she was watching over my shoulder. And, going, oh. and she's, she said she thought, you know, she thought she'd stumbled on me having some sort of Einstein moment, which by my standards I was, which is still a long way short of the big album. Yeah, you got, got a whiteboard anywhere in the house so you can do the big equations? No, no. Pen and paper. I love, pen, I love nothing more than cracking out. A few lines of stuff on pen and paper. It's a, it's a, it's a fast dying art. So you'd be one of these people that, when they're doing a story on a physicist or something, and they've got some formula in the background, you can go, "Oh, hang on, that's just a prop formula." I had a great chat with um, Matt Damon years ago, interviewing him about one of the Born Identity films. But he uh, was talking about when he was doing um, uh, Goodwill Hunting. And he said, "What was really hard about that is that famous scene where he's drawing the theorem and the triangles in the." Uh, in the corridor on the blackboard. And he said, so he obviously had no idea about the maths. He had a guy from the University of Toronto who was there advising him and stuff, and he said what was really hard was he was talking words that he didn't really understand. He was doing gestures with his hand that he didn't really understand, but they, the, the thing was they had to be in sync. Ooh. If he was talking and didn't realise that the bit he was talking about he'd already drawn five seconds earlier or talking about what he hadn't, you know, drawing what he hadn't spoken about yet, the hardcore maths nerds would go, what's he doing? So he said combining those two skills that he had no idea about. So it'd be like pretending to play the piano with one hand while pretending to juggle with the other when you can't do either. He found that mind-bendingly hard. But he did a great job. Now, I believe E equals MC squares is the result of a whole chalkboard yeah, of, yeah. of theorem. Have you, have you ever looked at that area there? Yeah, I've got a, um, a copy of Einstein's original manuscript that comes up with all that stuff, which is just, yeah, yeah, gorgeous, gorgeous. In Polish, so it'd be hard to read, but... So, so who's the guy you go, man, I wish I had his brain these days? Is it Hawking or someone else that we don't know of? There's an Aussie mathematician called Terry Tao, T-A-O, who's in the band of the best mathematician in the world. It's, I don't think you can ever say one person is the best, but he'd be as popularly voted as anyone as the best mathematician in the world. Grew up in Adelaide, now works in the States. And what's amazing about his mind is mathematics, while we think of it from high school as just one big block of a subject, mm. mathematics at the higher levels breaks into branches and they are as distinct as if if you were studying French and I was studying Hebrew and someone said, oh, you guys do languages, why don't you sit down and chat? Right. They are that yeah. distinct. Terry's genius is that he can jump across various okay. branches of mathematics. Or if you're doing something in number theory... And he talks to someone who's working in algebra. He'll say, you should talk to... I think you're working on the same... You guys should talk. I think what you're doing is actually the same problem, just seen through a different lens. If I could live in Terry Tower's head for a few minutes, that would be great. Or if I could be inside Magnus Carlsen's brain as he played a game of chess, that would blow my mind. So where does the scepticism come into what you do? Where, Where does that intersect with your maths? I think the essence of being human is to look at the universe and think... What's going on? That's what all humans do. So what separates us from dogs and animals? Why is this? How does that work? What's going to happen next? Of all the different tools that we have to try and describe the world, understand the world, predict the world, influence the world. Now you've got poetry. Poetry's great for describing the world. Not very good at predicting the world, I don't think. You've got religious faith don't really see the point of it. Numbers are the greatest tool we have to understand and conceptualise 
and, and live the process of being human. Do you think there'll be a, a simple solution like E equals MC squared? I think it's Anthony Green has thought that you know, one day you'll just be able to write on a window a simple... Yeah and that will be what is reality. Do you think that's possible? Yeah, that's, it's called the unifying theory or the grand theory of everything. Oh, the, the, like the paranormal people have that too. The grand uh, paranormal theory of everything is that the Earth's flat. Yeah. Because, it, it, because if, we, if you work back from that, that explains all the other conspiracy yeah. theories. Yeah, so I'm... I'm that's easy. <laughs> I'm a long way from being an expert in the area, but I would be surprised if there was both a single unifying theory... And the human brain was smart enough to comprehend it. Mm. It's one thing people have to understand is just because the universe is governed by physical rules and they may well coexist in some beautiful unified whole doesn't mean we'll ever be smart enough to work it out. Mm. Yeah, so people sometimes look at the limits of human thinking and what we can understand and go, therefore there has to be a God to be beyond that. That just doesn't make sense. I mean, if life had only got as far on Earth as dogs. Just say dogs were the most amazing thing on Earth and humans had never evolved. Just because dogs don't understand the Big Bang doesn't mean it didn't happen. Mm. It's a really simplistic analogy, but just because we can't formulate... So there's quite possibly a grand unifying theory of everything, but it exists at a level beyond our ability to ever comprehend it. Or it's possible that the things you need to observe for that grand theory to happen exist elsewhere in a multiverse that we'll never be able to expo- explore or observe. So we might, we might not be able to get far enough down the path just because it's not possible to, for us to see stuff that is there in some sense, but not within our temporal realm. And where can we see your, hear your uh, podcast videos and things? Where can we get that? I'm doing a podcast on the Podcast One network at the moment called The Big Questions, where I ask interesting people big questions. And uh, my books are available at adamspencer.com.au. That website again, Mm -hmm. adamspencer.com.au. One last question. Um, If if you're having a relaxing time and maybe having some drinks or something, is there anything that enhances mathematics or does everything take away from it? I've always engaged with mathematics most enjoyably when I'm really clear-headed, like actual mathematical thoughts, solving problems Mm. and the like. Telling beautiful stories about science and mathematicians and the journeys and all that can be enhanced when everyone's had a couple of drinks and their inhibitions are dropped. But if someone's had... Though there is, from what I understand, I only saw a tweet from Dr Carl on this one, so I didn't Mm -hmm. follow up the story. There seems to be bizarre evidence that if you study for an exam drunk you'll go slightly better if you sit the exam drunk than if you sit it sober. Places. But if you sit down and study, if you've, and not, not obliterated, but if you've had a few wines while you're smashing through an all-nighter to, mm-hmm. to do something, wow. you're better to have one so quick one. lightly buzz, lightly buzz. You're better to have one quick one to top it up just as you're walking into the exam. Oh. Oh. Well, yeah, it's got that wild thing, like, like the whole micro-dosing of LSD, like a very, 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 very small dose of it every day. Of, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, and it's, um, you know, it's conceivable for people at the cutting edge of research that that might liberate some way of thinking. My, my limited experience when I was... I never finished but doing my PhD of the people I was studying with, I don't think many of them were dropping much acid to try and crack Fermat's last theorem. <laughs> Look, thank you. Look, um, are you off now? What are you going to do? Out of here. OK. Flapping my wings and going away. Cool. Thank you. We'll just ca- found we'll... out I sold twice as many books as Dr Carl did yesterday, so I'm walking with a spring well, in my step. Uh, just the who sold twice as many books as uh, Dr Carl? This don't guy worry. here. This Carl, guy here. Carl will be hearing about it. Don't you worry. <laughs> okay. I'll see you later. Thanks. Thanks. Great to see you. Bye-bye. 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 This is Sharon Hill, creator of DoubtfulNews.com and the 15 Credibility Street Podcast. I have a new book from McFarland Publishing called Scientifical Americans, The Culture of Amateur Paranormal Researchers. Scientifical means attempting to be scientific and do science, but falling short. This book is the first full examination of the rise of amateur research and investigation groups in America and how they do or don't use science to investigate ghosts, UFOs, and cryptids like Bigfoot and lake monsters. I place these thousands of paranormal explorers into the historical context of their subject areas, chart the influence of paranormal-themed media and the internet, 
and examine what it means to do science and how amateurs can contribute. Paranormal believers, skeptics, and persons of all opinions in between will find Scientific Americans to be a unique view of the modern relationship between science and society, as well as our engagement with paranormal themes in popular culture. Purchase the book through your favorite bookseller or an Amazon Kindle version. For more info, visit my website at SharonAHill.com. From around the world, well, from around the United States, three of my skeptical colleagues give their uh, review of 2017 from their point of view, from uh, their projects and what they're doing. First up, from Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia, it's Susan Gerbeck. 2017 has been an amazing year for GSOW. I've spoken at skeptic groups in Syracuse, New York, Washington, D.C., Salem, Oregon, Scandinavia, Poland, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Spain, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Las Vegas. We're up to 132 GSOW editors in the secret cabal and have finished our 522nd Wikipedia page. Those 522 pages have given us 21,254,592 total page views over 800,000 views a month. We are growing, and we still have room for more people who want to train. Our most viewed Wikipedia page is the Blue Well Game, with over 2 million views since we rewrote the page in September. Other very viewed Wikipedia pages are Cryotherapy, Spontaneous Human Combustion, and the documentary What the Health. If you've never heard of these topics, you might want to check them out on Wikipedia. In other news, we are now a 501c nonprofit and are about to branch out into more activities. We are currently working on a psychic sting that will finish in mid-January. And as we are becoming a nonprofit, even more things will be happening in 2018 that will affect the community. So stay tuned. Find us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. We mentor and train. Join us. And now from the Squaring the Strange podcast, it's Celestia Ward. Hey Richard, and hey strangers, Celestia Ward here from Squaring the Strange, the weekly podcast that examines the mysterious and the mundane through a critical lens, with Ben Radford and Pasquale Romero, and sometimes me. 2017 has really been a banner year for us, certainly because we started existing this year. Our debut was back in April, and since then we've put out 37 episodes. Each of them takes a deep dive into a main topic, along with a quick look at whatever hits our skeptical radar that week. And, of course, a few skeptical fortune cookies from yours truly. Some of our favorite episodes so far from this year have been on GMO foods, the value of logical fallacies, and, of course, the episodes on cryptids. We try to look into a mysterious critter at least once a month. And so far we've covered the chupacabra, which Ben is the reigning world expert on, and also the popabawa, the lizard man, and just a couple weeks ago we covered Champ, the lake monster. We're lucky to have a really great mix of voices, as Ben brings his first-hand experience from investigations and his expertise on research and communication as an author and deputy editor of Skeptical Inquirer. And then Pasquale is a hard rock musician slash producer, and I'm a cartoonist living in Las Vegas. So while neither of us is a professional skeptic, we've seen our share of strange things, and most importantly, we love arguing with Ben. We had a wonderful guest join us back in August. Andrew Torres of Opening Arguments talked to us about legal skepticism. And we just wrapped up an episode with the Facebook famous Credible Hulk, who was able to sit in with the guys at the Strange Studios and talk about bro science and the myths and misconceptions of working out, just in time for people making their New Year's resolutions for 2018. So, While we're still a baby podcast, we're working on our production values each week and have already made some significant improvements in terms of equipment and our whole editing process. And as I talk to you now, Richard, we are hitting 40,000 downloads, which is incredibly wonderful. We're thrilled with that. We also got the good news a few months ago that we were picked up by a radio station in Wisconsin. 
99.1 FM wide LP in Madison, which means we have to bleep our bad words now and keep it relatively PG-13, which we do, even though we did have a pretty racy episode around Halloween talking about the phenomenon of supernatural sex. That is, getting busy with ghosts, which it turns out is a thing people report experiencing. So, wonderful tuning in with you, and I hope your year was fantastic, and we look forward to more Skeptic Zone in 2018. Finally, from the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, here's Evan Bernstein. Well, 2017 has come and gone, and just the other night, we had our review show for 2017 at the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, and we talked about pretty typical things that we usually review over the course of a year, such as the top science news stories of the year, a lot of them having to do with outer space, neutron stars colliding, Cassini plunging into Saturn, and other things, having also to do with things happening right here on Earth, including new archaeological discoveries, uh, more hominid bones being discovered, and CRISPR technology. We delved into that a little bit. And science marches on, as usual. Of course, we also have to talk about the people who are trying to bring down science, the anti-rational, the anti-science, the pseudoscience, and people who would be cheating and lying and stealing the real scam artists out there. They all got a piece in the review, certainly, for the year. I think 2017, compared to other years, had certainly a unique touch to it because of the passing of the novella's father, Joe Novella. And that sort of did have an impact, I think, on how things were discussed on The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe and sort of the tones it took. For example, for our two private shows that we did during the course of the year, uh, we got into some very personal discussions about things that we've really never talked about before, either in private uh, settings or private recordings or certainly on the show. So that experience sort of led us to sort of touching on these more personal topics, I think, than we've gone into in prior years, uh, which we received a lot of nice feedback for, certainly over the course of the year. And I think that was probably the most different thing for 2017. But we move on for 2018, certainly doing more of the same of what we love. And I know you, Richard, and everyone in the Skeptic Zone will be doing the exact same. So we will see you next year. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone, the second last Skeptic Zone for 2017. As I look in the calendar, I see there's one more coming up on New Year's Eve. The 31st of December, there will be one last Skeptic Zone for 2017. Little did I know when I started this podcast with Stefan way back in, Stefan Soika way back in 2008, that I'd be looking at uh, coming up to a 10-year mark, which will be next year. My goodness me. And my friends from other podcasts like uh, Skeptoid or The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe or Skepticality ask me or, or wonder if I'm still going to ca- carry on after uh, 10 years. And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? I hope so. I hope so. I get lovely feedback from listeners, apart from the listener who wrote a, an interesting comment to me lately saying that they really like the show apart from me. <clears throat> Merry Christmas. I guess you can tell the jet lag's kicking in. I better get to bed. I better do that. But until next week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from the Bay Area, San Francisco. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. You can be part of the show by downloading the Voice Byte app at voicebyte.com and using the hashtag Skeptic Zone. 
The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on The Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organisation. Thank you.